Well, thanks a lot um, for including me in the program, and uh, I'm happy to start this very first session. So, um, this is a paper co-authored with uh, Michael Lamla, who's also here, and Damien Pfeiffer, and the usual disclaimer applies. Um, and as you can see, uh, it's about uh, a potential spillover from the increase in last year's inflation to inflation expectations. So, yeah, I don't think in, in this conference I need to explain uh, that inflation has recently increased. And uh, we all know it did so after a, a decade or even more of inflation below target. And uh, in 2021, when it wasn't yet clear whether this would be a temporary surge in inflation or it might be more long-lasting, um, there was a big discussion about whether this increase in inflation, even if it was or could be only temporary, could be become entrenched in inflation expectations. And so we decided to uh, study which type of communication in such a situation might help um, to prevent such a spillover. So what we did was we ran a survey experiment in September uh, of last year where we studied two research questions. First of all, we wanted to check whether when we make people observe an increase in, uh, in current inflation, so we make that very salient, whether this actually leads to an increase in uh, both short and long run inflation expectations. And then if that does occur, so given that expectations are revised upwards, which type of additional information could help to mitigate such an increase. Uh, and just a brief reminder, right now 3.9% seems really low, so, but at the time obviously that was a big increase in inflation before it was just 0%. So we had a rising inflation in September 2021, and as I said, it was quite uncertain whether that would be just a temporary effect from the pandemic or it could be something which might be more long-lasting. So here you can see data from the Bundesbank survey of um, consumer expectations on uh, inflation expectations 12 months ahead and five years ahead. And uh, September 2021 is here uh, and here. So we see that in that situation, uh, long run inflation expectations were still pretty stable but we did already see that short run expectations had started to increase from levels around two to 3% to something uh, more closer to 4%. So the data that we're using comes from exactly this survey. It's run uh, by the Bundesbank called the Bundesbank Online Panel of Households. It's representative of the German population. And the nice thing about the survey is that they frequently let researchers add questions uh, to the survey or run experiments uh, within the survey. So we were able to add our questions to the September 2021 wave, uh, which consisted of almost 4,000 participants. And uh, we randomly selected these into five treatment arms, which then have about 650 respondents each. The core questionnaire, which is always um, uh, measured includes a large range of macroeconomic expectations, but that's what this survey is for. It also measures um, current and planned spending and saving, uh, and of course, a large range of sociodemographic characteristics. So this is um, the setup of our experiment. First, we elicit prior expectations on short run inflation, uh, that's 12 months ahead, you just saw the picture, and then on long run expectations, that can be either five or 10 years ahead. The core questionnaire does a random split of the sample and they just ask one of those two, and we uh, then use that as prior expectations, make sure that the, um, the range of expectations, um, the horizon is the same for our posterior expectations. So here we use the point forecasts, and then uh, we randomly select the respondents into five groups, and you can see them here. Importantly, 
um, everybody gets some information. So for us, the control group is not the group without any information, it's the group which just receives the basic treatment which informs people about the recent surge in inflation. So we make sure that everybody knows about the recent surge in inflation. And then for the other treatments, we just add more forward-looking information, which I'll show you in a minute. And we also have a placebo treatment where we add some information which is not directly related to inflation, just to make sure that just adding extra text doesn't uh, influence um, respondents' behavior. And then we elicit posterior expectations, also as point forecasts, where we remind respondents of their prior expectations. So in that sense, the measures, the changes in expectations that we get should not be uh, due to inaccurate recall of uh, prior expectations. Okay, let's, so let me show you um, the treatments. That's the most important part, obviously. So this is the basic information which everybody received, where we just said we now show you some information on the inflation rate. Um, the inflation rate in Germany was measured by the Federal Statistical Office at 3.9% in August 2021. So that was the most recent data available at um, the time of our survey. And then we said one year ago in August 2020, the inflation rate was 0%. So we basically informed people about the change in inflation from um, the uh, one year ago. Then our first um, treatment adding communication is this one here. We call this long lasting. Uh, and here we add a quote by one of the members of the German Council of Economic Experts, uh, Volker Wieland, who was quoted as saying, I too expect inflation rates may reach an average annual level of 2% and maybe even reach 3% by the end of the year. And I also anticipate that 2022 and the following years may see similar rates of inflation, that is annual rates of between 2 and 3%. So this basically uh, says that higher inflation than the one that we've been used to is expected for the current year, but also for the years after that. And the contrast to that statement is what we call the temporary treatment. This adds a quote um, by Christine Lagarde, uh, where a, a weekly newspaper called Handelsblatt, which focuses on economic topics, uh, wrote, the ECB president has always made it clear that she sees this year's high inflation rate as a temporary phenomenon. In her view, the increased inflation is down to one-off factors arising from the pandemic, which are now also making themselves known in the German figures for May. So this is very clearly saying that this is something which we see now, but it's only temporary. And then the last forward-looking treatment is um, just gives projections on future inflation from the European SPF. So here we just add a, a text saying that according to a survey by the European Central Bank, among experts in the euro area, these increased their inflation expectations for the euro area as a whole, including Germany, for 2021 to 1.9% from the previous forecast of 1.6%. And they adjusted their inflation expectations for both 2022 and 23 to 1.5% and their expectations for 2025 to 1.8%. So basically this is much more numerical than the previous statements and uh, it shows that experts also increased their short run inflation expectations uh, and then it just gives the numbers for the longer run expectations. And finally, um, the placebo treatment uh, also gives uh, a numerical statement about population growth, where we just add some text saying the Federal Statistical Office also predicts that Germany's population, which was measured at 83 million in 2018, will continue to grow until at least 2024 and will have started to decline by 2040 at the latest. Now, it's actually really hard to come up uh, with 
anything that is not related to inflation. So you could, of course, argue that population growth could also have an effect on inflation. But on the other hand, uh, its effect is at least not that direct. And uh, so that's what we decided on is our placebo treatment. OK. So and, and then after showing this text, everybody um, gets the posterior um, question. So uh, since everybody gets some text, this makes sense. And then we just ask on the basis of this information, would you like um, to adjust your inflation expectations for the next 12 months, given uh, in the first part of the survey? And if so, how would you adjust your expectations? So then respondents have the choice of saying either, no, I don't want to change, or of course also don't know, uh, or yes. And then we show them their previous forecast here, and then they can adjust it here by putting another number uh, again in percent. So again, a point forecast. And we do the same for long run, where we make sure that the horizon of the question matches that of prior expectations. So it's either five years or 10 years. If there are any questions, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. Yes. Well, in the first part of the survey, we already asked them what their expectations are. And then we ask them, these were your prior expectations, so do you want to change them now? OK. Um, so here um, we see the distribution of changes in short run inflation expectations. So that's the difference between the prior forecast and the posterior forecast for all our treatment arms. Uh, and I'll point out the basic treatment. So that's this one here. Uh, and you see the mean of this is positive, so that just uh, telling people that inflation has increased compared to last year uh, leads to uh, an increase in short-run inflation expectations on average. And what is reassuring is that the placebo treatment, this one here, uh, looks very, very similar. And we test whether all those distributions are uh, significantly different from each other. And we find that they all differ uh, compared to the basic treatment, except for the placebo treatment. So that's the only one which uh, seems to be statistically the same. For the other um, treatment arms, we see that the mean of the distribution somewhat shifts uh, to the left. And you see this most prominently in the SPF treatment, which is this one here where we see that the mean uh, is then negative. So on average, people reduce their short run expectations if we first tell them it has increased, but then give them projections from experts which are lower than, um, than the current um, inflation rate. And the graph for long run inflation expectations looks quite similar. Again, um, the placebo was not statistically different from the basic treatment. And we see that in both cases, we have this positive mean, um, so that there's also an increase in long run expectations after informing people about the current rise in inflation rates. But then giving extra forward looking information shifts the distribution more to the left. And here for the SPF, again, we see the strongest effect. So let's uh, take a look at this in a regression. Uh, and that's what you see here. This is the overall treatment effect uh, on posterior expectations. So now the dependent variable is just the level uh, forecast that people give us uh, after the treatment. And as you can see, this is strongly related uh, to the prior forecast, especially for long run expectations, but also for short run expectations. And the uh, main factor driving this is the fact that only 25 or 26 percent choose to adjust their expectations. So we have a very low number of uh, respondents that actually choose to update after the treatment. 
And one factor here obviously could be that this takes more effort, so it's easier to continue in the survey if you just say, no, I don't want to change. Uh, on the other hand, those that do change uh, their expectations, we can expect that they're actually responding to the information that we gave them before. And this is not just some random uh, update because of another question type or because of them forgetting. Do you see heterogeneity in the fraction of people updating across the different different groups? Um, I'm not sure actually. Do you remember? Mm, I would have to check again. I would assume that we do see some, some kind of heterogeneity. So this 25, 26%, that's the average, but I would have to check again. Just in general, do you have any thoughts? Like, you know, there are a couple of differences obviously across these months, not only like how persistent it is, also like uh, the German representative versus ECE here, and this is like the literature before, then in the local research, um, you know, some a specific name versus an abstract uh, represent, whether that might actually, not, now you don't see it here, but Then, like, regarding um, the follow-up questions, like, you know, do you want to adjust? You know, oftentimes one might be concerned of demand effects. Now we say it's only 25 percent, so I think that alleviates that a little bit. And given that it's also the same for the control group, I guess that helps. So, so you can effectively partially, hopefully, get that uh, out of it. But mm. I was just wondering whether you have any thoughts on that. So, regarding the names, maybe you can just go back quickly. Um, so here we have the name obviously as a direct quote, but also, um, well, yeah, you're right here. The name is not mentioned directly, it's just the ECB president. Um, but we're thinking what's the biggest difference between those two treatments. I mean, obviously there are many dimensions the, that differ. I, I wouldn't think that the type of newspaper plays a large role. I mean, they're both really, economic focused ones, one is weekly, one is daily, but well, I, don't, I don't think that there's a lot. I would actually think a lot of people don't know these newspapers. So much in the German context, but definitely in the US, it really plays a role. That's true, yeah, there could be different. I mean, these are definitely not politically biased newspapers. They're um, quite, quite neutral, I would say. Um, what I think is a big difference between those two treatments is that here we have just text, whereas this one mentions numbers, even if they're just included in the text, but it mentions numbers. And um, I'll, I'll show you in the results that I think that's something which is driving our effects here. All right, now. Um, Apart from this persistence in, uh, in, um, in expectations, so many people uh, choose not to change their expectations, um, but then we also find uh, treatment effects in addition to that. Uh, and these are pretty stable, as you would like to see whether we include demographic controls or not. So um, that's good. And then we see that overall what stands out here is the SPF treatment. So giving information about experts' inflation projections tends to lower uh, posterior expectations and uh, the effect is relatively similar for short and long run expectations. Now we have two dimensions of um, um, of this effect. Um, the one is on the decision whether to update or not. And then the second one is on if I choose to update, by how much do I change my expectations? So that's the next thing that we uh, want to look at. Um, and so here we call that the extensive margin. That's just the probability of choosing to update your, uh, your expectations given um, the information. Uh, again, everything is in relation to the basic treatment. And there we see um, that this is not driven by the SPF treatment, but rather by the other treatments. Uh, and interestingly, um, the temporary treatment, which was meant to be the most calming in a way by saying, look, don't worry, this is temporary, it's going to pass soon. Uh, and this uh, uh, reduces the likelihood of updating both short and long run expectations. 
But for short run expectations, we also see a similar effect from the uh, other text uh, based treatment saying that this was more long lasting and interestingly also from the placebo treatment. So in relation to just informing people um, about, uh, about the current rise in inflation, this additional information also reduces uh, the probability of an update. Of course in the placebo case it could be that people get confused and they say well, <laughs> what's this uh, stuff about population growth. Okay, but what if people choose to update? Uh, and that's what we see here. Uh, and there we see very strong effects uh, from all the forward-looking treatments, um, except for the placebo, which is good. We don't want to see that here. That shouldn't really um, affect how people update their expectations. Uh, but for all the others, we see that this additional forward-looking information uh, really um, reduced um, the change in expectations for both short run and long run um, in relation to the basic treatment. And the largest effect is here clearly um, the SPF um, and the others are, are smaller but they're all um, uh, strongly significant. So any type of forward looking information uh, seems to have an effect here. Population growth. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I think it could also have been just the confusion that, you know, they didn't know what to do with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I can just conclude. Um, so, yeah, this is a, just uh, an experiment testing whether if we uh, make an increase in um, uh, current inflation salient to uh, consumers what type of additional forward looking information could help to mitigate that and first of all in the type of question setup that uh, we used where we didn't make it particularly easy uh, for respondents to update their expectations so it had to be kind of a conscious decision to take, uh, to do that effort, to take that effort, um, just about 25% um, opted to do this. So I think this speaks to uh, lots and lots of results that we have in the literature about inattention, even in, in the face of such an increase uh, in expectations. Um, but uh, those that do update uh, tend to revise their expectations by quite a bit. As you saw here before, um, there's 1.5 percentage points uh, for short run uh, expectations in the SPF treatment on average. Uh, and here even for those less clear perhaps or less direct uh, forward looking statements, uh, it's still 0.5 percentage points um, on average. So that's quite, quite a large effect. Um, if we just tell people that inflation has increased, this does lead to an upwards um, revision in uh, short and long run inflation expectations. And that's contrast to other studies which have provided information about current inflation in a low inflation regime where we typically had a downward revision because people tend to overestimate inflation and then they were made aware of this fact and then they revised downward. Now it's the other way around because suddenly inflation has increased so that makes sense. Uh, but then any additional forward looking information which in our case we must add um, kind of goes in the opposite direction. So even the Volker Wieland statement which wanted to warn about longer lasting inflation gave numbers which were below or way below 3.9%. Um, so even that had a kind of downward um, effect on this initial increase. So this mitigated uh, that spillover effect. 
And um, at least on average, we find that the numerical inflation projections, because they're just numbers, and they're easy to compare to the number that we gave before, um, they caused um, the strongest reduction in inflation expectations, provided that the revision takes place. So that's kind of the condition. Okay, thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, no, we can't do that here because we use point forecasts as our, as our measure. So we made a conscious decision not to use um, this type of question where you have all those bins. So in, in this survey, um, they, they measure inflation expectations with two types of questions. You have the point forecast question and then you have a question where um, you have to distribute 100% probability across um, several bins. Uh, and, and that's a question which um, households tend to find very hard and uh, there's, there are lots of studies now uh, around uh, showing that it matters a lot what the ordering of those bins is and, and also the, the, the length, uh, the width of the bins and, and so we decided not to use that type of question. Uh, maybe if I did that again, I would uh, kind of use the min-max question after the treatment, and then you could use that. I think that's uh, maybe a good compromise. Um, but here we just had the, for uh, the point forecast. Um, so thank you so much for having me here, for putting our paper on the program. Um, much appreciated. Uh, it's a uh, joint work with... Uh, Dimitri, who is sitting also here with me, so thanks for the support. Um, and as you can see, we are uh, struggling with the overall title. We like the flashy one, but uh, um, as you can see, the paper has also some bits uh, and pieces uh, we like also, so perhaps it moves the attention too far away from some other uh, potentially interesting aspects, but you can tell me this uh, afterwards. So, the alternative version would be a bit more boring. So does communication of the Bank of England improve attentiveness and the reception of correct news also to aspects uh, uh, we believe might be of importance? Um, I think uh, similar to, to, to Lena's comment, uh, it's uh, not really relevant to highlight communication, this kind of group. So uh, let me sketch all the things I would normally say on three bullet points, uh, basically saying, well, it's important. Second, uh, the empirical evidence regarding consumers is not as good as uh, the benchmark group, the professionals, which react significantly and instantaneously. And uh, when we compare this to consumers, well, uh, the evidence is not great, both in terms of size, but also in terms of decay. Um, it seems to be a different bunch which needs to be addressed, but also there's some hope. So this sounded a bit negative, but there are, seems to be some highlights and uh, there are papers around. Michael uh, ha has a nice paper that shows that there could be other ways to improve this, so we don't need to be stuck with those unresponsive consumers. Uh, for a long time, there are uh, options to improve this. Nevertheless, there is still um, a substantial lack on how to reach and inform consumers and make their expectations better and with that make the decisions better uh, for all. So how do we uh, want to contribute here? And I think we want to do this in two ways. First of all, we follow in terms of the identification our previous paper where we survey consumers just before the communication event, ask them about their expectations, perceptions, and what news they heard, and so on, and rightly after the event, so that we get an idea what the impact of the event actually is, how strong it is, and don't have so many confounding factors we need to account for. And second, we want to um, look deeper into some aspects we didn't do before, and look also at the different banks. So we'd like to concentrate this time on the Bank of England uh, for two reasons. Well, it's nice to go a bit outside of the US 
and provide some additional evidence uh, for other countries. And I think, or we think, that the Bank of England is a nice example for this because, I mean, right now many banks are moving forward and becoming more engaged with the greater public, but I think it's fair to say that the Bank of England was one of the first who started this endeavor. <clears throat> and then uh, it might be interesting to see how this fares as compares to the Federal Reserve. And then we would like to focus on some channels or aspects we deem interesting. First of all, uh, we'd like to see whether these social media channels make a difference. Then we would like to see whether actually if consumers receive the correct news makes a difference. So there are papers which uh, correlate the news floating around with expectations. There are some papers that are asking that you hear something uh, regarding the central banks. And we would like to go even one step further and asking them, what did you hear actually? Because with consumers, it's not trivial that they actually understand what's actually happening there. So we asked them when there was an interest rate decision, what was the decision? And not in terms of basis points, we don't want to make it too complicated, we basically asked them, so did interest rate went up, uh, went they up stayed the same or fall? And if they answer this correctly, we say, okay, this is correct news. Somehow this media informed them uh, having the correct news and then we can, from this, I think, have a cleaner idea what actually means for consumers to have the correct news and if central banks can uh, improve the shares of people receiving the correct news and what the effects are. And lastly, we would like also to talk about attention. I mean, this attention term is all over the place. So we ask also consumers whether they have received the news. They didn't search for this, they just received it by chance. So they open up the newspapers and here they are, something of the Bank of England. I didn't want to read this, but now it is there, so I have a glimpse on it. Or whether they actively searched for this. So was there an intrinsic demand to get news about the central bank decision? Or they just came across? And whether this makes a difference or whether central banks or this announcement um, increased the people that uh, came across this news and wasn't searching for them in the first place, which I think is uh, quite interesting. And uh, similar to the talk before, if you have any questions, if I made things not very clear, please just chip in, okay? Um, this is just as a reference to the Bank of England, which this uh, does things similar uh, in such a way, just a reminder that the communication has changed quite a bit from long texts with fancy charts to a bit more, um, more comprehensible for the greater public. So I wanted to give some credit here. So uh, how do we approach this? We focus on the MPC meeting, so we don't take the whole universe of announcement. We f focus on the important uh, monetary policy decision meetings. Um, so all communication of the decision of the Bank of uh, England's MPC, um, which have the publication on the inflation report. So they, it's a companion report which gives you additional information on inflation forecasts and so on. So it's an important uh, meeting in the calendar of the Bank of England, which I say it's quite, uh, which, which is an information event. So we focus on those meetings. Um, particularly because this inflation report gives more insights on how the world will look like. <clears throat> we use a uh, natural experiment design because we have a random assignment and this natural treatment, which is the announcement of this report and on the interest rate decision. Uh, we uh, use an identification which is quite narrow. Of course, it's not a high frequency financial market identification tick by tick, but in terms of consumers, it's higher than we are usually using. So it's a day by day or two days before and two days after. We collect data using an online survey, which has the advantage that we get data very fast in a very narrow window of time. So we have very comparable people in, um, with a comparable information set. And uh, 
can control for quite a bit of aspects that deem for us to be important. In terms of the timeline, uh, the press conference uh, is usually on Thursday, so we collect for each wave 550 complete responses, um, start our uh, wave on Tuesday, and usually um, it is collected within, or the majority is collected within four to five hours. Sometimes it takes a bit longer. Uh, then we have the press conference, and on the Friday morning, we start our second wave, so when people are reading about uh, this kind of event or haven't perhaps already heard it before, they can now answer that they have uh, or gotten some information or not. And then we can compare those two groups and see how things are changed. So in terms of the questionnaire, uh, we follow our previous paper, which of course follows uh, or adapt some question types that have been there before, uh, particularly the University of Michigan Survey of Consumers. Um, we ask about confidence. Uh, we identify people um, before the announcement as zero and after the announcement uh, as one, and then can control for a large set of um, socioeconomic demographics like age, gender, education, financial literacy, and so on, which device they are using, where they actually are, which time uh, they started their survey, how long they take for this survey, and so on. So it's a quite a rich um, data set uh, to look at the different aspects. And then on top of this, as said, we look at those three dimensions. First of all, uh, we don't only want to know whether they heard something about the Bank of England. We want to make sure or check whether they hear the right thing. So those people that answer that they have heard something about the Bank of England, then they get the follow-up answer. So what did you actually hear? And then they can uh, say, yeah, I hear interest rate went up, stayed the same, and of, uh, have been reduced, and then we code them if they actually decided the right thing or answered correctly at the day or not, and those that answered correctly um, are then identified as receiving the correct news. So we check uh, what's, what's there, and once we have the correct news, we can then elicit how important it is to actually hear the right thing, uh, which hasn't been done before. Um, and what we see, just a teaser, so one out of six respondents um, get, get it wrong, so which is roughly 13%, uh, which is not big, but still uh, a sizable number that even if you say, yeah, I listened to this event, they somehow mix it up. Yes? No, no, it's, 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 it's a fair comment, right? So not every commentator is a big fan of the Bank of England and the particular decision. And if you uh, listen to specific news outlets, you might be biased in the other way or, or the, on the one way. I mean, we cannot, I mean, this is an interesting research question in itself. How those two, those two companions, uh, like the bank decision and some comments, how they uh, form together an information how you react to this, right? If there's dispersion or uh, negative statements about the Bank of England uh, decision, what you make of it? Uh, we, uh, it would be great to do this. We focus basically, uh, our question was basically designed in a way, what does the central, uh, what did, what you expect from the Bank of England to be 
to be deciding. So it's just on the Bank of England whether it's right or wrong, something. But uh, I agree, would be nice to have. Well, right now, it's basically how much they have to rise interest rates. This would be another dimension, right? Perfect. Uh, anything else? So we, we just asked them whether they heard something and what they no, heard. Us. Can you remind us what were the actual decisions? Well, in, in this time, there were not many decisions. So it's mostly zero and I think one or two rises. Yeah, so I mean, that's the problem. Because I want, that's easy, right? And still 13% get it wrong. No, uh, this, this is another uh, argument I, I am happy to take on. Yeah, it it's certainly would be interesting to redo this in the new environment where there's a lot more happening. Yeah, but then I guess the answer is always interest rates go up. So then you have also, I'm not sure, it's then also not so obvious because everybody, believe, everybody believes that interest rates will be going up. But in terms of attention, the, the shares and uh, uh, perhaps news heard shares might also be spiraling up uh, when we would redo. But this is uh, an excellent remark. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is one thing. Then we uh, asked them whether, when they heard news, whether they just stumbled upon this or actively searched for this. Uh, so. Uh, uh, to, to identify some level of attentiveness, whether this matters. Right? As you rightly said, this might differ over time, but I think, well, well now we collected this, let's see how the numbers are in um, calm times where not much is happening, both on the inflation side and the interest rate side, so at least we have now a benchmark. Yeah? So uh, I think there is no good or bad about this, collecting this number in the specific period. So now we have it, and then whenever somebody comes up with a new number, we can contrast it. But I think it's good to have it to get, uh, get an idea how many people search for this. And I think this is also most important, whether, um, or uh, came across, whether banks are able with their communication to reach people that are not actively searching. Like if the share is always constant before and after, then apparently the news effect is dominated by people or the decision uh, on, or the change in expectations is dominated by people that are always actively searching, that are always interested in the central bank. So then, basically, there's no, in such a scenario, there's basically no point for communication because those people are always active. So we are really interested whether announcement can change those people that suddenly stumble upon this. Because those are, I'm not sure they matter a lot, but it's, it's nice for the central bank to know that they can reach people that are usually not very much interested in sitting in front of the Bloomberg terminal. Uh, and lastly, of course, um, social media. Uh, banks are engaging in social media, so we wanted also to have a glimpse on this aspect and uh, uh, whether those people that are following the Bank of England on Twitter, on Facebook, are different, are the same, are better informed, uh, and so on, so on, so on. Okay, uh, so let's have a first glimpse in the data. So we collect um, expectations uh, or perception on inflation, expectation on inflation, uh, 12 months ahead on the past rate and expected rate. We ask for a car loan, so we just want to have some interest rate we're not particularly interested in the bank rate, but just some kind of interest rate and how they change over a narrow window. So this is, this is why this might be a bit, the numbers might be a bit higher or substantially higher than the bank rate, but for us it's just a change between the days, so, and we want to have an interest rate people might be aware of. 
Um, in terms of data, they are, of course, uh, higher than you would usually expect. Uh, if you look at the distributions, they have the expected or the often documented peaks at 2%, 5%, 10%. 10%. So this kind of focal points where people respond. So uh, it seems nothing unusual happening here in terms of um, um, the data collected. Then we have some additional summary statistics which might be of interest. Uh, so this is the News Bank of England. So this is the share of people that receive news during the week of uh, the decision. So on average, 35% of our respondents received any news from the Bank of England. And this is, of course, a high, inform or, thanks, high information event. So if you compare it to weeks before, this should be definitely lower. So this is basically the maximum so to speak, you could reach in calm times. In more exciting time, right now, right now I think this, this number might be certainly higher. But it, it is a benchmark we provide. Correct news. Um, so these are those people that actually got it right in terms of the interest rate decision. We have 30%. So uh, one has said one sixth get it wrong. Most of them get it right. Um, received. 70% who answered uh, about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the news variable said they just received it. So they didn't search actively for this, they just stumbled upon this. Well, which seems okay to me, but as we ha don't have any benchmark, um, uh, it, 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 well, how it is. Um, Twitter, we have 3% of Twitter followers. This might be higher right now, but uh, at that time, so we collected between 2017 uh, to 19, so uh, three years just before Corona, we stopped. Um, it's uh, 3%. Uh, announcement means basically 50% uh, of our data is before the announcement, 50% uh, of our data is after the announcement, which is just a check. And then we have some controls. Uh, uh, the balance on the gender, the year of birth, uh, is ensuring that not only the young internet affine people are responding uh, to us, but also those people that are almost as old as I am, which is a bit, I don't know, ensuring or... Uh, uh, but it's good that we have a balanced population, and then also this income, and then we have also some insights on uh, expertise as well as education. Good, um, then we come to a, our estimation approach. We basically very often uh, use this kind of equation. So we explain a variable yi with the, the announcement dummy to see what the, the effect of the announcement really is because we compare the group before the announcement and after the announcement. And if you do this in a narrow window, you can make some causal statements. I mean, is, I don't want to push causality too much but I think it's um, the main advantage uh, of this kind of approach that all these confounding factors uh, uh, can be set aside because in this week, the, the Bank of England announcement is the major announcement um, and we survey people before the announcement, after the announcement, so everything that changes should be related to the announcement. And then we can check uh, um, the variables we are interested in. Uh, so in this estimation, we basically infer whether an announcement increases the share of people that receive news on the Bank of England. And what you see here is, so there's a probability that 20% more people received the news about the Bank uh, of England after the announcement. So when something happens, way more people are informed. Oh. Um, and if you compare this to the FED, uh, when we did this uh, several years ago, uh, this was roughly 10%. So apparently in the Bank of England, this number is substantially higher. And the question is why it is, right? One argument would be that perhaps this, this, this approach of uh, catering to the public more strongly and having some reports that are uh, un not translated, but uh, are um, put in easier language might be fruitful. 
Right? This, this could be one argument. We cannot prove this. We just show that there's a, per a difference between uh, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve. Um, but the bottom line is here that announcement increased the amount of people that have heard something about the Bank of England, and this is something, this is a, a good sign. Um, the effect is slightly stronger for uh, correct news, so also the correct news is informed, and there's a tilt towards more correct news, but uh, this is certainly negligible. Um, in terms of search and received, so, um, do we see something uh, in that respect? And what we can say that the share of um, uh, received people uh, substantially increased, so 6% more uh, people receive this news after the announcement. So there's also a positive effect that you reach more people that are actually inattentive. Um, when we now look, does this reaching people matters? Then we need, of course, to look at something uh, that might be meaningful. And we look now at expectations. So we now have showed that people, there are more people that receive news, uh, more people that receive correct news. And the question is now, um, does it matter for them? And uh, does it matter can be displayed in terms of expectations. And uh, if, if we look at this, uh, we see that uh, when we look at um, perception error or an expectation gap, so the difference between the realized inflation or the difference between the expectations and the realized inflation, we see that um, receiving news reduces the error and receiving the correct news reduces the error even stronger by, by the factor of almost two, which I think is nice to see that if you receive actually the correct news, the effect is stronger, that your expectation, the quality of your expectations becomes much better. Yeah, so receiving news from the Bank of England matters a lot for the quality of your expectations and receiving the correct ones is even uh, much better. Then we can look whether receiving news through Twitter matters. And uh, we see no effect on the probability of receiving news. If we do this on this quality measures, so perceived and uh, perceived inflation and then expected inflation, we see interestingly that this uh, Twitter effect is even in the opposite direction or insignificant. So those people that are following the Bank of England on Twitter or uh, following the Bank of England on Twitter have not necessarily better expectations or better perceptions. Uh, better uh, expectation means the difference between what you expect now and what was the realization one year from now. And w we just see if this distance decreases or not in compared to those groups that receive news. Right, we're not saying they must be on top, they must reach this kind of um, low number. We're just saying, how do they fare in compared to those groups that haven't received any news? And we see that those people that receive news have a smaller margin of error. Follow the Bank of England of Twitter. Yeah. Oh, one, sorry, I didn't. Why do you put the sound bites of people and take one specifically rather than the media information? I didn't get the last one. Do they get news from newspapers versus Twitter? Oh, okay. Uh, with Twitter, we just thought we want those people that follow uh, the Bank of England. We didn't. Okay, you're, you might be right at just saying I read through Twitter anything about Bank of England would be an alternative way of questioning this, yes. But we thought people that follow the Bank of England of Twitter 
is also a signal. So we decided to opt for this. But uh, I fully uh, agree with you that this is not the only way to do this. And perhaps being a bit more broad on Twitter might be a better way uh, for the future. But we can discuss this. And with this, I think uh, I would almost close. The last thing I would just say to you that people that follow on Twitter are very confident. Uh, so this is an interesting combination. Therefore, we like the title at the beginning. So the people that follow Twitter are super confident, but make bad forecasts. So I'm not sure uh, how this comes along. But this is uh, what we find. But still, it's a, it's a small group. But we, we, we thought the effect was uh, quite striking. And uh, if you have any thoughts on this, uh, I'm uh, happy to hear them. And with this, uh, I basically want to conclude. And thank you a lot for staying with me. Zoom it, uh, Bernie, in case you follow us online. Thanks for including our paper on the program. This is joint work with uh, Francesco D'Acunto and Andreas Fuster. And kind of what we're trying to do is kind of whether, you know, the identity of the sender kind of matters for the extent to which, uh, you know, people and particular different subpopulations might incorporate the same identical message in their expectations. And so, like, the motivation for this paper was, like, you know, one of the first uh, tweets by Christine Lagarde after she took the helm of the ECB, and so she posted on Twitter that she had this like informal gathering somewhere in the town, was just outside of Frankfurt. And maybe, while I'm personally not on Twitter, so maybe I'm not confident, and hopefully have better expectations. What happened subsequently actually was what I think is uh, called on social media a shitstorm. You know, is it really just white men and so on? So people were kind of questioning, surprised to notice that you know there is Christine Lagarde. In case you haven't found her. She's sitting here in the back, and then, like, you know, it's all, you know, kind of old uh, white man. And so, like, what we try to understand, you know, is whether kind of the composition or the making salient, uh, like, potentially the lack of or the representation of different populations on decision making bodies might matter. It's also, like, something that was highlighted for the US, and policymakers have actually mentioned that potentially having a more comp uh, diverse composition could be actually fruitful. And beneficial. There are different uh, channels through which this could be beneficial. Christine Lagarde actually mentioned that from a pure kind of legitimacy and representation angle, one might want to actually try to get uh, more diversity. Uh, Sharon Donnery said, well, maybe if you have actually different points of views due to different backgrounds, this could be actually lead to better decisions. While, of course, they are all valid points, we thought with our toolbox, we have very little to add. Uh, to uh, the, these two points, and instead, what we try to uh, talk to is a p point raised by Jay Powell, whether actually, you know, making salient the representation of different subpopulations could actually, through like, you know, inclusion or in effective communication angle, reach different subpopulations. And the way we want to do that is actually like through a survey experiment, so it's very similar to what Lena presented in the first talk. So, like, you know, imagine now somehow we come up with a way of making salient that a black male policymaker or a white female policymaker is part of the FOMC relative to a white male policymaker. And then we send identical messages and we want to understand is it that women and black survey respondents might react differentially depending on who is actually made salient in the survey experiment. We have 9,000 people in our survey. And then we want to also shed a little bit of light through which channels and mechanism might potentially mediate this effect. Is it a, tr a trust channel? Like, you know, do I, if I see someone that looks like myself, do I trust more the central bank? Or is it potentially that I become differentially more interested in actively gathering information? And then, like, you know, we also want to talk a little bit of whether, you know, maybe a, a different drivers of the effect could be homophily in the sense that, you know, I just actually associate more with people that look like myself, then you could be concerned that, you know, maybe any beneficial effect on women and black survey participants partially might be set off by maybe white men reacting less in the survey. Alternatively, it could be that I have a taste for diversity, like representation of people that currently are underrepresented of the sport, and then a positive effect on, like, uh, diverse subpopulations should not be offset necessarily by the majority population. 
And so, like, you know, I think it's just briefly, I think, you know, relative to like a long literature many in the room have contributed to, like, you know, the only thing we kind of want to bring to the table is like instead of changing the message, the channel, Twitter, or something else, we want to actually keep all of those things constant and just actually try to differ on uh, the sender of identical communication. Okay, so like the way we do that, we have in total like four stages in the survey. Very beginning, just a few basic demographics, prior knowledge, who is in charge of ba setting basic levels of interest rates in the US, the CEO of the big banks, the treasury, the president, the FOMC in randomized order. Then we also elicit prior expectations for the unemployment rate and inflation over the next 12 months. And then like our key stage is now the second part of the survey. And what we do here, we have in total seven groups. One control group receives a figure and some text. And then six treatment groups, also a figure and some text. And the way we do that, we have in total three, uh, and I'll show you screens in a second, we have three treatment groups that receive forecasts for the unemployment rate. Three treatment groups receive forecasts for the inflation rate. All the forecasts are exactly identical within ARM. And then what we do, we just differ the picture we associate with those identical forecasts. And let me now show you first uh, the control screen. So like here, we want to have like also a figure on the side and the little text where we just purely describe what the FOMC is and its composition. Then two treatment groups see this figure. That's just Thomas Barker and we specify his role and title. And then we actually have three treatment groups that we see from the summer of economic projections in June of 2020, what their forecast for the inflation rate in the 2020 and 2021 is. This just maybe to the discussion earlier, even central banks can actually be pretty off as you see in those forecasts. The next uh, two treatment groups are a picture of uh, Thomas Barkin, uh, sorry, Raphael Bostic, um, the president of the Atlanta Fed. And here again, you do see like the inflation rate treatment, but we have a similar treatment screen with the same figure, but the unemployment numbers and the unemployment numbers you see now here. Those are the forecasts by, uh, from the summer of economic projections for 2020 and 2021. And this time, however, we showed Mary Daly, president and CEO of the San Francisco Fed, was also an alternate member in this meeting in June of 2020. So all three regional Fed presidents, all three alternate members, so it didn't actually vote, but all three also contributed their forecast from which we draw like the treatment information in the figure. Now, of course, you could say like, you know, many, many things differ across those three pictures in addition to race and gender. So we did a little bit what we would call like a manipulation check in a uh, auxiliary survey on MTurk, where we just show people randomly the three figures. And then we ask them, you know, do you know this person? You know, what do you think the profession of this person is? How likable, trustworthy, and so on. By and large, no one knows them. That's maybe already good or bad, depending on what you want to see. For us, it's maybe good because like, there's no differential recognizability. They are similarly credible and trustworthy. The only difference that we notice when we ask them, like, what do you think is the profession of those people? Like, this gentleman was more likely to be associated as being a lawyer and Mary Daly was more likely to be a sort of a, exactly, like a high school teacher. So like this were the only differences. But I think, you know, the, the largest differences, I think, uh, are in fact actually race and gender. Okay, then the uh, additional two kind of um, uh, parts of the survey, we elicited then uh, kind of uh, posterior expectations. You know, as uh, we heard earlier by Lena, oftentimes, you know, asking exactly the same question twice, people don't really like that. So that's why we actually uh, elicit uh, posterior as Mansky style, so meaning specifying a probability distribution and asking them to allocate mass to these probability distributions. We also ask them to which extent they trust the Fed. I'll come back to that later on. And then at the end, we have a few more uh, characteristics of people. So in terms of like respondents, as I said, like about 9,000 people, 50-50 gender ratio. We have 30% uh, 30, uh, 30 African-American, 20% Hispanics. We slightly oversampled African-Americans just in case we wouldn't find any effect that it wouldn't be due to lack of statistical power. And then we also had standard kind of speeding checks. So like the two questions a la like imagine, you know, there's this issue that people just rush through the survey to just indicate that you followed, clicked now, I really like sports and I had a drink last night, something along those lines. 
And then we had actually a follow-up service six weeks later, which I talk about at the very end. Okay, so like, what I wanna now do in the following is actually show you mainly graphically, I think in the interest of time, I likely skip uh, the table. So like, I wanna first show you some raw descriptives for different subsamples, comparing like first white survey participants, male, female, and then black survey participants, male, female, and first in terms of raw statistics, but then also like, you know, with about, I think uh, exactly 65 different fixed effects, keeping constant like race, gender, you know, education, income, uh, dummies, family size, housing structure, whether you have a 401k, so all type of things that could potentially affect to which extent you might be informed. And in, in general, we also in the regressions directly control like when people did the survey, their prior expectations and things like that. And then you might recall that, you know, we started the survey in early August and ran until early September. End of August 2020, we had uh, Jackson Hole where they actually switched to AIT. So like if you limit the sample to anyone who actually finished before, that virtually doesn't make a difference because 90% had actually finished before the start of Jackson Hole. Okay, and so the way I wanna now show you actually results is via two complementary ways. So the first one is like, remember we have this Mansky question and as Lena was saying at the very beginning, you know, these type of questions are typically quite uh, cognitive demanding in terms of answering. So like, you know, just to get a, first a simple, you know, idea of whether people kind of like, you know, trust this forecast and whether they put lots of weight on that provided number. We had just created dummy that equals one if the modal bin covers the specific forecast that we provided in the treatment. So imagine like the treatment, the, the treatment number was, I don't know, 1.9% and we have a bin CO2 to two. If now the most mass is allocated to this bin or the bin covering the second number that we provided, then we actually say that person has anchored expectations, but we also of course can directly actually use the probability distribution implied mean that we use as a secondary outcome. Yeah, that's what, uh, yeah, we, we keep them. And if this would be like the, the modal bin, in, uh, of course, it's a modal bin, but if this modal bin would cover like, you know, here it's like either 9.3 or 6.5, this would be then one for unemployment. And uh, if it's, uh, if that bin is like, CO2, it would be one for inflation. I just think it's also a way to very fast answer the question if you put 100% somewhere and then you can continue. But yeah, but a fraction with a 100% on average, I think was pretty low for us. And then given that we have about 10 bins, if it's really just because they want to answer quickly and get over with it, I think you know, it would be a really small fraction in our survey, but we can definitely check that. Okay, so like, let me now show you first for white survey respondents, like, you know, a couple of things. So what you see here is now the share of survey participants in uh, dark gray, male in light gray, female, that has what we call anchored expectations. So most mass on like the bin that we actually had uh, provided the treatment information for. Couple of things I wanna highlight here. So like, you know, ex ante, like the control group doesn't receive any information. There's certainly, you know, some differences in terms of anchored expectations, but independently of whether we look at female or male survey participants, receiving information increases the share of survey participants relative to the control group. Remember, just read a text about the FOMC composition, no numerical forecast, that has anchored expectations. Then let's actually also look uh, at uh, two additional things, like, you know, the treatment effect of, like, now seeing Receiving information and have seen Barkin is about 16 percentage points. Control group, no information. Instead, the treatment effect is about 50% larger if uh, white women see the picture of Bostitch or about 25% larger when they see uh, the picture of Mary Daly relative to seeing the picture of Barkin but having the same information. So like everything is constant, like numbers constant, the way we transmit this number, the only thing that is different is actually the picture people see in the survey. Instead actually for white male survey respondents, you pretty much don't see any difference in like the treatment effects independent of which picture they see. Yes? No, unfortunately, we, we didn't do that. We were a little bit limited in terms of like, you know, uh, kind of space. 
but uh, so we wanted to actually first focus on this uh, specific kind of differences, but I'm, I'm with you like also like in general. So like here, we can mainly talk about making salient the representation of male, but so we cannot say really anything about like diversity per se, or like the optimal degree of diversity, what we also did through like a, an auxiliary server, an MTurk, we wanted to see whether our treatments are effective. And so when you ask them, you know, what is the fraction of women on the FOMC? You, and you uh, show them Mary Daly, it increases like the perceived number of uh, female policymakers, for example, by a little bit more than one. So like, it does actually uh, shift the comp perceived composition, but unfortunately we can say nothing really about. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at uh, black server respondents, same structure, dark gray male, uh, light gray female. Similar to previously, we do see like receiving information is actually beneficial relative to not receiving information. Here we now see like you know, the treatment effect for black uh, female server respondents is about four percentage points. Then you see Thomas Barkin, it's actually 10 percentage points if they see Rafael Bostic, and it's actually 16 percentage points when you see Mary Daly. For black male server respondents, here you do see somewhat of like, you know, a, a similar reaction across treatment arms. If we look, I guess we have to skip that, in the paper we also look at like the probability distribution implied mean, and there you do see that black male server respondents in fact also react slightly stronger to Mary Daly relative to uh, Barkin, but here in this anchoring indicator you don't see that. Oh, so here are the numbers, let's just do, 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 skip that. And so like what we now want to briefly mention, so like for inflation expectations, so like we chose unemployment and inflation on the one because we had like the information from the summary of economic projections, but also uh, because they are part of the dual mandate. And then actually when we look here at treatment effects, you do see that information matters, meaning like comparing you know, those two bars relative to all of those bars but you see that it doesn't seem to ma really matter differentially. You do see slight, slightly larger treatment effects for black female respondents, but by and large, we didn't see strong effects for inflation. And then, you know, we were struggling a little bit at first, kind of trying to understand whether it kind of matters for unemployment, not so much about inflation. Now, you know, what we kind of argue, but you know, we have to be uh, kind of upfront here. This is just our exposed specializations, what we found in those uh, survey experiments. Like if you look at realized inflation, there's not really much heterogeneity. Well, there's tons of heterogeneity, but very little systematic heterogeneity by race, gender, or income. And instead, like of course, like you know, realized unemployment uh, differs tremendously across kind of uh, subpopulations in the US. So there is systematic variation. So like for a variable where maybe, you know, people have a really good idea what it is, unemployment, they may be personally affected, knowing that there's someone in the room that actually maybe shares their background or experiences, and then actually is made salient, might be more important relative to a variable inflation that for many people, at least when we still did the survey in the summer of 2020, is a rather abstract concept and people have a hard time if you ask them what inflation is, most people actually are not able to really kind of articulate and there's not really like a large heterogeneity in the data in normal times. Okay, now I want to briefly talk about a couple of uh, channels that might potentially uh, mediate this effect. And, you know, one channel could be like, you know, you know now I see uh, as a female survey participant, there's a female policymaker, maybe I increase my level of trust in that institution. Now, of course, this would mean that ex ante, there should be differential levels of trust across different subpopulations. Now, we didn't elicit trust before our treatments, but we have the control group that didn't see any picture of an po actual policymaker, and so therefore we can now see whether there are systematic differences in the level of trust in the institution by race and gender. And that's what we want to do now. So like here, what we uh, uh, elicited, to which extent do you trust uh, in the Fed to adequately manage inflation and the unemployment? Or to which extent do you trust in the fact that they care about the well-being of all Americans, including people like yourself? We elicited by a seven-point Likert scale, trust a lot, trust a little. In gray, we have uh, male survey, white male survey participants. In red, we have everyone else. And here you do see that uh, black and female survey participants in the control group that didn't see a picture have like a distribution that is 
systematically shifted to the left, meaning to a lower level of trust. And now we want to see whether like female and black survey participants, you know, decrease their level of distrust when they see daily in Bostitch relative to Barkin. So what we do now, we define a dummy that equals one if survey participants have a low level of trust, like one, two, or three, zero or otherwise, and now we want to understand whether the share of survey participants that has low level of trust decreases if they see Bostitch and uh, daily relative to Barkin. So again, white survey participants to the right, black survey participants to the left, we have uh, dark gray male, light gray female survey participants. And so here you see for white female survey participants, the share that has low levels of trust is 46% if they see uh, Thomas Bach, and it decreases to 41 or 42%. If they see Mary Daly, it's rather flat for white male participants. And you see even larger effects for uh, black survey participants. Let's say for women, the share with low level of trust is also 46, goes down to 39%. And for uh, black male survey participants, it goes down from 39% to like uh, 30 and 31%. So a substantial lower level of distrust or actually a higher level of trust when they see a diverse uh, policymaker. Okay, so like a complementary channel could also be like, you know, once I see as a black or female survey participants, a black or female policymaker, I might just actively be, become somewhat more interested in that institution, want to learn about it, and kind of, you know, what we would call an information acquisition or gathering channel could also be potentially uh, operative and effective. So, like, we want to look at that in two complementary ways. So, first, in our main survey, we look at some indirect proxies for this information acquisition channel, and then we also want to look at it through like a follow-up survey. Okay, so like, um, here like, you know, I mentioned earlier, like to which extent do you know who's in charge of setting basic levels of interest rates? Even there, ex ante, you do see systematic differences in the level of informedness, which of course is like a necessary precondition for this mechanism to be operative. Okay, so like, as I said, like, you know, this is rather indirect proxies, like here we now look at white female, black male, and black female survey participant interacting with the Bostitch Daily Dummy. You know, we just pool them, given that those are very mild uh, kind of uh, proxies, and we want to understand, do they spend more time, you know, with, uh, without controls or with controls, it's about like, you know, 4% more time on the uh, whole survey if you see Daily or Bostitch relative to Barkin. Then, you know, in terms of like, do people recall the name of the policymaker? No one recalled. <laughs> and then uh, the last thing, you know, at the end we had a question, you know, do you think like, you know, the survey was interesting? And there's some mild evidence that they're about 3% more likely to say that actually the survey was interesting. When women and black survey participants do see Mary Daly or Raphael Bostitch relative to Bach, and it's always this differential, do you think it was interesting? Okay, so now instead actually a little bit more direct evidence for this information acquisition channel. So here we do like, you know, what I think the New York Fed people back then, Andreas was part of it with uh, Basit Safa and co-author, kind of initiated this idea of an information acquisition experiment where we have a follow-up survey, we recontact everyone, we had a re response rate of about a third in the follow-up survey, as it was about six weeks later, you know, we have certainly uh, less power, but Qualtrics, uh, through which we ran the survey, told us, so like, you know, just to make sure there's hope of finding anything, we only focused on one dimension, which was gender, and we wanted to understand whether female participants are more interested to read an article about uh, monetary policy if we make salient that the article covers, like, a female policymaker relative to a male policymaker, and we also then, you know, varied, just to make sure that it's not anything peculiar, we also varied, like, the institution to see actually whether this makes a difference. So, like, we uh, separated our 3,000 survey participants in three different choices. Like, everyone kind of had to read an article. There was no choice of not reading anything. So, like, they couldn't rush through the survey. And then we asked them, in the first one, you know, just the choice between an article about the CBO versus the Federal Reserve. The second choice was between a male policymaker that we actually stressed with Mr. Swagel, CBO director, or Mr. Clarida from the Fed. And then the last choice was between Mr. Swagel, the same male policymaker from the CBO, versus 
Mrs. Bowman, that was a Fed governor. Now what we want to understand are women more likely to choose the Fed article in treatment arm three when the choice is between a female and a male policymaker relative to women in the second treatment arm or in the first one, but then also like potentially, I don't know, maybe people don't like this surname and like that surname. So like we also compare the choice of male survey participants across the different treatment arms to kind of look at a double difference, female treatment group three versus treatment group uh, two, and uh, taking out the same difference uh, for male survey participants. And so what you see here now on the y-axis, we have the share of survey participants choosing the FED article. On average for males, it's about 60%, slightly larger in group three relative to the other two groups. But what you also see like the share is uh, for female survey participants 13 percentage points higher to choose like the FED article if it is about a female policymaker relative to uh, the FED article when it's about a uh, male policymaker. And if you do now this double difference, it's about nine percentage points, which is still you know, significant at the 6% level. So the you know, bottom line here is like, you know, uh, if you make salient that a female um, a policymaker is on the FOMC, you know, women become differentially more likely to be interested in actively gathering information about that institution. You know, it could be that maybe, you know, the reason why we also see like a slight increase of about, you know, maybe two or so percentage point that ex ante men thought, you know, it's only like a group of like the figure we saw at the beginning, old white men. And so like they are kind of surprised to hear that there is a female policymaker. And that's maybe why they're also slightly more interested due to this surprise component to learn about this female policymaker. That's something unfortunately we cannot test uh, directly, but this would be potentially consistent with that. So like, you know, at the very end, so a few more things we did. So I told you earlier, like we did this manipulation checks. So on the one hand, you know, indeed those treatments, if you see in an MTurk survey that we did afterwards, if you see Rafael Bostich or Mary Daly, you increase the perceived number of female or black policymaker on the FOMC. So like, you know, this manipulation was successful. We didn't see, however, any systematic differences in terms of trust, credibility, Actually, li likability was slightly different in the sense that uh, Thomas Barkley was less likable relative to uh, Mary Daly. But again, looking at those are small differences also due to the facial structure and things like that. No one actually knew the name, however. If you did like, you know, you could also say, but Michael alluded to that, do you see that any of the treatments we did in the first round were persistent after six weeks? And by and large, then, uh, the answer is no. And you know, one of the reasons that we think it's actually that it's also a substantially reduced uh, kind of sample size. If you were to do our baseline analysis in the main survey on the 3,000 people that we were successfully recontacting after six weeks, even there we would barely find uh, any effect. So like, that's really like a small sample issue. But in general, these type of interventions are oftentimes uh, pretty short-lived. No, so we, we did actually ask for trust, uh, likability, credibility, and so like that, uh, for like trust and... Uh, they were similar, yes. Okay, it's so like, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier, like, you know, we also wanted to shed some light. Is it like, you know, homophily, like, you know, I would uh, associate more with someone that looks like me or more like a taste for... Uh, diversity, if it was the latter, we should expect that you know, it has to be heterogeneous across the population. And so like, you know, by and large, we think our results are more in line with the heterogeneous taste for diversity. For example, if you look at the results for white females, like, you know, if it was a pure homophily, you would expect that they should react strongest to Mary Daly, same gender, same race, then to uh, uh, Barkin, given that at least the same uh, uh, race versus like, you know, the least reaction to Bostitch, but that's not what we find in the data and similar uh, arguments hold for the other groups. And so like, you know, if it's really then this taste for diversity that differs across the population, you could also imagine that within the overall population of white 
uh, male survey participants that there's also like you know heterogeneous taste for diversity being present I don't know among more progressive or kind of uh, liberal kind type of survey participants and like you know we didn't well we to some extent like we have some different uh, proxies for kind of uh, getting at this question we had a question at the end do you support the Black Lives Matters movement do you think women in the US are discriminated if you are younger you tend to be actually more progressive in the US and also the Democrats tend to be more progressive than if you are self-identified Republican that we would also elicited and you know again all of those are more indirect proxies for this taste of diversity but then if you look at an interaction term between these dummies and whether you see Bostitch or Daly within white men only you do see like you know for all four interaction terms you do find positive coefficients some of them are significant all of them of course highly correlated if you were then to do like you know horse race you do see like for the inflation anchoring like uh, the BLM support still matters again if you look at uh, distrust in the Fed all of them negative and then in this horse race women are discriminated it's still kind of surviving and so like let me just uh, conclude here and so like you know what we try to do in this paper is trying to understand if, whether you are able to make salient the representation of female or black members on the FOMC whether this has potentially a scope for like differentially you know uh, increase the ability of the Fed to actually enhance the communication and we do find some evidence that survey participants then are more likely actually to uh, incorporate these expectations that are identical across different uh, treatment arms into their own expectations we show that actually it's due to the trust and uh, kind of information acquisition channel and the results are more in line with like a heterogeneous taste for diversity and you know there are many things we can say it's like it's more making salient we cannot say anything about the optimal degree of diversity or even the composition of the Fed so like you know it's like more of like a marginal effect we cannot say anything about the optimal composition or even the persistence of the effect thank you hi everyone um right. okay um thank you very much for attending this session okay um, i'm yahui from ntu in singapore and I'm currently a visiting postdoc at Stanford GSB. Um, this is a joint work with um, Sumit Agawa, Pulak Ghosh, and Chang Chang Song. Now, the title of our paper is called Inflation Expectations and Portfolio Rebalancing of Households Evidence from Inflation Targeting in India. So, as the name suggests, the name is very important today. <laughs> okay? So, we're going to study how the relationship between inflation expectations and how households rebalance their portfolios an experiment in India. An experiment is inflation targeting. So essentially, we're going on a world tour today. So we started off with Germany, then to England, and Federal Reserve, US, and now we're going to India. Okay, so let's go. So allow me to motivate this paper now. So in recent years, as we're all probably aware in this audience, there's been a growing interest in the use of inflation expectations as a policy tool. This is because changes in expectations could effectively impact the real interest rates, which would then impact consumption and savings. However, we realize there's a lack of empirical evidence that studies how households rebalance their portfolios. Intuitively, when there are changes in the real interest rates, what could happen is that households could actually reach for you if the real interest rate actually goes down. So how households rebalance their portfolios is a missing piece that we think we should dive into a bit more. A quick point to take note, there's been much work done in literature to date that talks about how the actual inflation rate as well as how the returns of stock market returns are since uh, Farmer 1981, for example. So what we're trying to um, contribute to literature is to examine and study how does inflation expectations play a role in affecting how households um, invest in risky assets, for instance. And this potentially has a big impact on the amount of risk in the economy as we change our expectations, you know, how we uh, reinvest the stock market and so forth. Now, moreover, there's no consensus on the impact of inflation expectations on consumption, and we try to um, um, shed light as well in this area by showing the importance of the household balance sheet. Okay, so I'm going to now give a brief overview of this paper. So this paper, we have uh, three key contributions. Number one, we're going to show the relationship between households' inflation expectations 
and how households rebuild the portfolio. Indeed, we found that whenever there's a fall in inflation expectations due to this targeting policy in India, there's an increase in savings by 25% and decrease in investments by 2%. So essentially, whenever inflation expectations went down, what we saw is that households re rebuilt the portfolio and shifted away from uh, risky assets into safe deposits in a way. Number two, we highlighted that um, household balance sheets played an important role in this um, studying of inflation expectations. And we realized that households with the most liquid assets, those with the most savings, were actually, um, uh, confound, uh, were actually confound and aligned with these Euler equations predictions, but not those with illiquid assets. And point three, we're going to hide, focus on the role of rigidity of savings deposit rate. So essentially, during this time period that we can see, there's some rigidity going on. In particular, the savings deposit rate in most banks, commercial banks, are quite constant. And with a flat constant interest rate by commercial bank, coupled with changing in inflation expectations, this could have some impact in the real economy. And we hope to shed light in this area as well. Okay. All right. So I will now talk about the empirical challenges that we face and how we overcome them. So first, research design. So it's challenging, of course, to understand uh, how households make decisions to gather the inflation expectations because they are potentially endogenous. In this room, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of all these omitted variables that could occur and so forth. In addition, there's also information rigidities to study changes in inflation expectations. So we're going to overcome this problem by focusing on a, a natural experiment in India, inflation targeting. So inflation targeting is a policy strategy due to monetary policies because in order to manage the prices into a stable level. Now, what's going to happen is that in India, they did not adopt this policy only until February 2015. So before February 2015, they actually adopted an approach called a multiple indicators approach, which focused on things like foreign exchange rate, foreign reserves, and so forth. So it's a multitude of things. And there was no consensus about the use of inflation targeting policy, even though there were some suggestions here and there, but there's a lot of debate going on. Yes and no, yes and no. In the end, they announced on February 2015. And indeed, they announced a policy rate of central target of 4% for the rate with bands of plus minus 2%. In comparison, the actual inflation rate in the year 2014 was 5.8%. So it's about a benchmark thereafter. Now, so as this so-called policy change is, um, is uh, exogenous in a way, and un un unanticipated, yes, Michael? So the historical volatility of this uh, stock market is actually um, quite stable during some period. Yeah. In inflation, or inflation. Or inflation in this context, for example, uh, has been quite volatile. I think the next slide you will see, next, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you shortly. It, I'll show you a slide shortly. So my has a question about the volatility of this inflation. I'll show you a slide shortly that shows that after this targeting policy took place, it became very stable. I'll show it shortly to you. Okay. Now, so the second challenge that we face at the end of the day is about data availability. So we need data of households' individual inflation expectations, as well as their changes in their so-called consumption, savings, and asset portfolio decisions. So to overcome this challenge, we're going to rely on two data sets. So we're going to combine two data sets. So the first data set we have is going to be the inflation expectation survey of households that's conducted by the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India. And the second data set will be the administrative bank data that we got from one of the top four banks in India, which allow us to understand household decisions. Now, but one issue is that we're not able to link them together because they're in different data sets, different individuals. So what we're going to do instead is to um, link them by city level and beyond. Okay, so the first data set is going to, as I mentioned earlier, is the RBI's Inflation Expectation Survey data. So it's a quarterly data set, and we center on this time period, 2014 and 2016, which is actually one year before 
and one year after the policy change. We also have things like the demographics, like city, gender, age group. And we also focus on households in six cities that can be mapped with our second data set from the bank data. So this is what we see in general. So in general, we can see this is the age, about 39 years old, 44% are females, and this is the current inflation expectations. Now, so the second data set, which is an administrative data set, is actually from one of the leading banks in India. So again, we have this demographics that we can map, like occupation, city, gender, age, okay, and income. And more importantly, we have a detailed micro-level data of all the uh, so-called consumption, investment in risky assets, and bank deposits. So for consumption number one, we have that credit card spending, debit card spending, and ATM withdrawals. Number two, the, for the investment in risky assets, we have things like mutual funds, as well as equity investments. And number three, for bank deposits, we have savings account and term deposits. So as mentioned earlier at the start, for these bank deposits, we have a constant interest rate of 4%. So during this time period, what's happening is that we are going to have a fixed so-called nominal savings rate that's being incurred, okay? Which means that changes in inflation expectations will subsequently impact the real interest rates. Because for, for savers, for example, the amount of money you put in the bank is fixed in a sense. So it's a summary stats of this second data set. So in all, we make use of 153,000 um, individuals. And then because we look we focus on time period three months before and three months after, based on this um, uh, benchmark study, we have this about observations. So the amount of consumption is about 17,000 rupees, which is about 200 US dollars per month for these households. Thereafter, we also have about total savings, is about 500,000 um, rupees, which is about 7,000 US dollars. So this is a typical um, um, household that we have here. Okay, let me now talk about this um, volatility of inflation rate. Now, as highlighted earlier, we have two different data sets. So the RBI inflation data, data set for expectations, and second data, data set will be this administrative bank data. So we need to combine them together to find out what's the impact of these um, inflation expectations on the household's outcome. So we have two empirical strategies. So the first strategy, for identification is to follow literature that highlights the importance of regional heterogeneity. So you can see that these are all the different cities, six cities that we use, that is common in both data sets that we have. And before this so-called changes in this um, efficient targeting policy, it was quite unstable. It's going to downward trend, for example, it was unstable. And subsequently, after this policy change, it became much more stabilized, in a way, just by visually. Moreover, we realize that there's a lot of heterogeneity across different cities. So some cities, you know, do have a higher, some have lower, for example, and the change of this policy change shock different cities differently. So because of the fact that there's different changes in the inflation, actual inflation rate, this, we are, we are, this motivates us to use this change in inflation expectations across cities as one of our empirical strategy. You may ask, so why does different individuals in different cities respond differently? And why does different cities experience different actual inflation rate? So there could be many possible reasons. For example, like news, as mentioned earlier in the second speaker. Okay, so news does play an important role as well. So we run some regressions, we check, we find that different cities with different number of news media does impact actual inflation rate and the expectations as well. But you could be concerned that perhaps the shocks um, to these inflation expectations could be driven by common shocks within the city itself and not due to expectations per se. So to alert this concern, we're going to tighten our identification strategy even more by focusing on this thing we call um, city, age, group, and gender bins. So we're going to um, um, explore this cross-sectional heterogeneity by looking at different so-called possibility in, in this context. So in all, we're going to have 24 bins. 24 bins because we're going to have six cities, two gender groups, and two age groups. So for age group, we classify into older and younger population. So for example, one bin, we could have things like a younger male in Delhi. Second bin could have like older female in Calcutta. So different bins will have uh, different characteristics at the end of the day. So we want to find the change now per bin. 
So we run this uh, standard regression where we have this uh, pi it, it's the expectations of these individual respondents, and different means, uh, and find a post indicator to see the change in these inflation expectations after the policy has taken place. So essentially, what we're trying to do okay, is to tighten our identification strategy even more by not looking at just city, but, but city, age group, and gender. So we're going to see you know, how different people behave in these different contexts. Yes? Political views. So we are not able to control for political views because we do not do any survey on their political views per se. But what we know is that we, have, that we know which city they are in. So if we know which city they are in, for example, and different cities have different political affiliations in general, for example, and we, we do control for that in our fixed effects. Yeah. So it's been absorbed in our fixed effects accordingly. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So this is our, what we're trying to do to find out the variation of the change in the expectations accordingly. So to find out the, the impact of inflation expectations on household outcome, we're going to do a standard diff and diff regression with a change in inflation expectations as a treatment intensity. So the treatment intensity will be the change in expectations pre and post targeting policy. So as in all um, diff and diff strategy, we must show an event study first to show this common trend. So the minus numbers are refers to um, before uh, before this, uh, coefficient, before this um, targeting policy. So after policy, it will be positive numbers. And we see that in general, there's uh, not much um, thing going on for consumption spending. But for savings, it's a common trend prior to this policy announcement. Then after we find is an increase in the savings and the fall in the risky investments. So as highlighted earlier, there's something going on as households shift from their savings are uh, risky assets towards savings assets whenever there's a change in your inflation expectations. Yes? So if I interpret the data correctly, we don't have the same residuals from the survey about expectations in the data set and, and standard expectations. That's right, correct. So, so um, we are not able to distinguish between the two di different data set, expectations and household's outcome because they're different data set. So the first thing over here will be a city strategy, which could be due to common shocks due to city, right? So a second strategy will be to make use of city age group gender bin, which is a tighter specification. Thereafter, we did a lot more robustness tests to verify and check that it's not due to city shock as well. I'll talk about our robustness test at the end of the session. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, it's a intensity. intensity. So the, this is a treatment intensity. So if we look at our main specification results, for example, this is a treatment intensity. It's a change in the inflation expectations. So basically, how we interpret this data will be whenever there's a so-called fall in inflation expectations, it's an increase in this bank deposits by this 1,000 rupees and the fall in investments by 170 rupees accordingly. So this is a change in expectations that we have. So uh, the previous plot for expectations. Yeah, we do see some uh, changes in expectations as well, uh, but I did not show it here. Yeah, here it's in the paper as well. Yeah. Yes, we do have. So it's right at the end. I'll show you shortly. Yeah, so we've anticipated the paper. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So we do show a lot of heterogeneity involved in terms of who are the ones that drive the results. So who are the ones that drive the results, we'll show you shortly in terms of the households, individuals, households portfolio decisions. Yeah. 
So what we are going to do is that we are going to um, so-called map them, okay? And we do see there's some changes taking place in this context. And to allay concerns that, so we are, we are also concerned, we are also totally aware that it could be due to city-wide shock, we are concerned too. So we did a lot of tests and verified verify that it's not due to city-wide shock per se. So for example, news media, for example, or finding change, okay? And this due to this targeting policy per se. Yeah, so we tried to verify that at the end. Okay. So a question you ask is this. So if you believe our results, okay? So you ask, what, so why is there an asymmetric impact on rare returns? So we're going to hypothesize that the nominal rate of this risk-free rate does not change one to one with a change in inflation expectations. So what we see right now is this. The nominal interest rate is kept constant in a setup at 4%. So if you change your inflation expectations, what's going to happen is that the real return will go up. And whenever the real return goes up, households will then switch from so-called uh, other assets into savings deposits, which now offer a high, higher real return. In comparison, for risky assets, stock markets, for example, their the real return should remain constant across time because they are real assets, for example, which could actually uh, refer to the productive capacity of the economy per se. Okay. So then this is the question that I think uh, Michael asked just now in terms of hydrogen effects. Who are the ones that drive the results? So we, we're going to exploit our rich data set a lot more by focusing on this hydrogen results accordingly. So first, I want to find out is this. Li uh, liquid savings. So how does savings play an important role? How does liquidity drive our entire results? So what we're going to do is that we are going to separate it into 10 different bins, and we're going to rerun our different diff regression again. And we realize that this, uh, across these savings deciles, so it's the lowest deciles for savings, it's the highest deciles for saving, there's going to be a fall in this so-called uh, consumption across time. So even though at the aggregate level, we do not see any impact in terms of household consumption, those at the highest liquid savings deciles do actually consume less whenever real interest rate goes up, which is in line with the predictions of the Euler equation. Moreover, who are the ones that really balance the portfolios? So to understand who balance the portfolio, we look at these two um, diagrams, change in savings and risky investments, and we realize that only the top deciles are the ones that are responding. So the top deciles are the ones that are responding by moving from one form of asset to another form of assets. In comparison, there's not much uh, changes, you know, okay, for this uh, lower themselves accordingly. So, so basically, our point is that the household's balance sheet matters to a large extent. So for consumption, even though at the aggregate level we don't see things, there's still some action going on, especially those who are, have higher savings accordingly. Now, the second uh, form of our heterogeneity test we're going to do it's a focus on loans. So we also have data set in terms of the loans that these um, consumers have accordingly. So what's going to happen is that we're going to do an um, inter interaction term. So this is our main benchmark as well. Consumption, bank deposits, investments. And we realize that for those with loans and higher fall in inflation expectations, they actually end up investing more in risky assets. So this is interesting. Yes. Correct. So this data set is based on fixed, inter fixed interest rates. So basically, this is what we have with fixed interest rate accordingly. So if you have fixed interest rates, for example, and the fall in inflation expectations, you expect a real interest rate that goes up as well. So those with higher real interest rates at the end of the day will actually respond more by investing more in risky assets. It's possibly because they are worse off, and so they choose to switch to more uh, risky assets that reach for you as compared to the others who actually have a reduced in the risky investments. So basically, our, our point is that the, it's important to understand how households respond and rebuild the portfolio from risk-free to risky assets accordingly based on their different profiles. Okay, so I'll talk briefly uh, about some robustness tests to allay our concerns. So there could be many possibilities as well. So one possible reason could be that um, our results are driven by stock market participation rate in cities. In different cities, what you can see is that uh, some, some can participate more actively as compared to others. So we actually created an indicator, which is the percentage of households that invest in the stock market in each city 
and we do not see any significant results too. We did also uh, many falsification tests based on the different time period, different time period before this uh, policy shock and so forth. Again, no results, we didn't see anything. We also did some placebo tests by randomizing these different bins, you know, okay, we tried different things. So we tried to randomize and try to allay the concerns. We also tried to do by pin code as well. If not comfortable with this um, um, citywide, we should do by pin code level because we have pin code data. So all these things actually sh do show, okay, that um, the results are driven primarily by the expectations of this first data set, RBI data, data expectations on household's response. Okay, so I'll end up, end up now with um, our three points. So we do believe that our results have some policy implications and we call it three R's. So the first R is that it's important to take note of the risk-taking behavior as households do represent the portfolios. So it's important to understand how households represent the portfolio as because they, they may end up taking risks in this context. And this is something we need to be cognizant of. Second R, the rule of household balance sheet is also very important as well as individuals try to uh, man manage their infrastructure expectations, especially during this time where we have um, elevating of expectations of uh, households, you know. So how would they, how's, what's the role of this household balance sheet? And the third R is the rigidity in bank deposit rates. So amidst changes in inflation expectations, so we do show that, we do document that one form of rigidity, which is the bank deposit rates, actually end up changing the real interest rate of households that's being experienced by them. And when the household's real interest rates are being affected, ultimately, it could affect their decisions as well at the end of the day. Yeah, so this is my three R's at the end of for this day. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for your time.